All right. Um, so our typical cycle when we when we start keeping bees is we you know we buy package bees um, and these are three pounds of bees with uh, they come in a little cage and you sh you know they come through the mail you usually get a kind of worried phone call from the post office in the morning with buzzing sounds behind them you know your bees are here um, they are usually shipped in from southern states or places that are warmer so for us you know that would be Georgia Florida. Uh, sometimes they're coming from California, places that can build up early, make these packages, and then uh, ship them in time for us to have them in April or May. So we, you know, we buy bees, um, and we bring them to wherever we are in, in, you know, here in Kentucky or wherever you are. And uh, of course, they face environmental pressures there that might be different from where those bees originally came from. Uh, the raw mites are pretty much everywhere now. You know, we have unique weather patterns, we have um, other kinds of critters and diseases and uh, forages and just, you know, everywhere's a little bit different. And so, um, so we, we install our bees in, uh, you know, in our hives. And uh, a lot of times when we first start out, and it, certainly for me, when I first start out, you know, I start with one hive, you might have a couple, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, and our bees, you know, uh, maybe die because we're, we feel bad. Maybe we're, we're new beekeepers. We feel like it's our fault. We've got these environmental pressures going on, um, you know, whatever it is. And, um, and this was, this was my experience when I first started, um, bees, um, but luckily I stuck with it. Um, so next year we think, it, you know, if we haven't given up, we, we say, well, let's, let's give it another shot. We dish out the hundred, 150 bucks for, uh, another set of bees and, and buy a couple more packages. And of course the environmental pressures are still there and um, nothing's changed in that, in that regard. Um, and, you know, our bees may or may not die <laughs> again. And um, we end up on this kind of, um, you know, cycle, this treadmill of, of, uh, of, of purchasing bees and then having these, these challenges. And then some of our bees or sometimes all of our bees, and um, it can be really discouraging, especially for new beekeepers. And, um, you know, we've known a lot of folks that have kind of quit after a couple of years because they either didn't, couldn't deal with the heartbreak of opening a, a, a hive in spring and having dead bees or um, couldn't keep dishing out cash for new bees. So, um, so one of the things that we, you know, we do about this is um, we deal with some of these, these environmental pressures. The biggest one right now that honeybees and beekeepers are having to deal with is varroa mites. So these, if you're not familiar with them, um, are essentially um, kind of like a, a bee tick, right? They're a, they're a parasite. They latch onto the bees and, and suck their uh, fat, actually. They used to think it was their hemolymph, their blood, but um, they feed off the bees and they um, can cause, they can vector diseases, uh, mainly viruses that can cause problems too. So this is probably the biggest challenge right now in, in beekeeping. Um, and so what, what we typically do would treat, we would treat, um, you know, we have these, these chemicals that are called miticides because um, you know, they're a mite. And um, so we can, we can use these miticides in the hive and there are different kinds, they've been around for a while. Um, and at first, you know, they'll, they'll kill most of the mites in your hive and your bees will survive. But um, what, what happens, right, is it's all the bees that survive um, are ones that may or may not have survived without that intervention. So I, I say weak bees survive here because um, we don't know. They, they um, you know, if they only survive with this treatment, then um, uh, that's what I'm genetics here. Um, there's something else that's, that can go on, and um, this is specific to the treatments we use, but a lot of times there are side effects to using what is essentially an insecticide inside an insect colony, right? Um, there can be sublethal doses uh, of, these, of these miticides that can affect the longevity of your queens. Um, the older, the older uh, treatments in particular are uh, fat soluble, so they get uh, taken up and absorbed in the wax. We do our best. Okay. 
So uh, long story short is, you know, sometimes these treatments can, uh, can actually cause health issues to our bees too, especially um, over time, if those residues build up and, um, and if, you know, if you get it wrong, right, if you put too much in or not enough or something like that, um, it can cause issues. So we've got this other uh, feedback loop going on here though with the mites. And that is, <clears throat> you know, none of these treatments are 100%. And so um, there's always a few mites that, that survive that have some kind of resistance to whatever pesticide, whatever miticide we're using. And now we have these kind of, uh, you know, super mites that no longer respond to whatever miticide we're using. And, um, and then, you know, obviously those are the mites then that will um, reproduce or that are around and this is a simplified, um, you, you know, example, but um, pretty soon the mites that you have are no longer, no longer respond to whatever treatment you're using. And so, you know, at that point we will, um, you know, usually switch what the active ingredient we're using or whatever miticide we're using. And, um, you know, that works. We, we get pretty good control for a while. And um, you can kind of see where we're going here, right? Eventually the mites will adapt to that one. Pretty soon that miticide won't work. And um, we've seen this happen with um, some of the older miticides for sure. Um, the fluvalinate and kumafos um, are showing high levels of resistance. Um, and we, you know, we just keep, keep going. Um, We'll, we'll use another one. It works for a while. Pretty soon things change and we're, you know, kind of right back on our, on our treadmill here. Um, and, you know, this system is, it's, it's the best that we've, we've had um, in a lot of ways. And I don't, um, I, I want to say right up front that I don't, I don't judge anybody for, you know, wanting their bees to survive and using treatments to help, help their bees. Um, you know, everybody's comfortable at different levels with, um, with this, but, um, but the long-term uh, uh, prospects here are not great, right? We just keep on having to change what we're doing because biology wins out in the end, right? The mites continue to adapt. And we see this pattern over and over in agriculture, um, whether it's, you know, mites and honeybees or internal parasites in sheep or uh, herbicide resistant weeds or insecticide resistant bugs. I mean, it's just, this is how nature works. It'll eventually overcome. Um, and so we end up on this kind of sh short, you know, treadmill that we just can't, we can't get off of. Once you're on there, it's hard to, to break out. Um, and, uh, there's a quote that I, I want to share. This um, Laura Langnick spoke at the um, in in uh, this year at the uh, Southern Sog Conference, and she said something that really stuck with me. And that was, if it's not sustainable for the farm, we're talking about sustainability. If it's not sustainable for the farmer, it's not sustainable for the farm. And you know, we tend to think about sustainability and resilience in ecological terms, right? what's 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 good for the environment but as farmers and as um you know beekeepers we have to think is this sustainable for me am i going to be able to continue to purchase bees and and do these treatments and things so it's a big picture thing um there's a lot of literature a lot of uh, you know honeybees are the most studied insect uh, in the world and um, we've had a relationship with bees for a long time so there's lots of good uh, literature out there, and I encourage you to dig into it, you know, with a Google Scholar or something like that. Um, I wanted to share some uh, some quotes here uh, talking about these treatments, uh, these miocides, and I'll just read it for folks that aren't, aren't um, able to. It says, these chemical treatments are, uh, can actually harm honeybees, leave residues in hive products, and can become ineffective as var Varroa destructor. That's the scientific name for Varroa. It's very intimidating. Varroa destructor. Uh, Varroa destructor populations can swiftly become resistant. Additionally, mite control treatments also remove the selective pressure of natural mite infestation, preventing co-evolutionary processes towards a stable host parasite relationship. Well, that's kind of um, science ease for 
we are breeding weak bees and strong mites. You know, those bees never have a chance to adapt to this pressure. And I, I should say up front, um, varroa mites are not, um, they're not a traditional uh, parasite of Western honeybees, of European honeybees. They actually jumped hosts from the Eastern honeybee, Apis serrana, which um, did evolve with the varroa mite and has a different life cycle such that they, they live together and varroa is much less of a problem for Eastern honeybees than it is for Western honeybees. And um, when, that, that, when they jumped hosts, um, uh, our European honeybees have not had the same amount of time to adapt. And so, um, so that's what that's basically saying. You know, we, when we intervene by using miticides, we don't give the bees a chance to, to adapt. Um, one of my beekeeping mentors, Les Crowder, um, who's an amazing beekeeper, uh, does top bar beekeeping and um, just one of, one of the uh, kind of my bee heroes. He said something that, that stuck with me um, through the years. He said, whenever we use a chemical solution to a biological problem, eventually the biology adapts. We need to find biological solutions to biological problems. And um, this has really resonated uh, to me throughout you know, my studies in agriculture and as I work with farmers. Um, again, we just see, see this pattern over and over and over again. And, um, but I find this to be a really hopeful statement because, um, because we can use biology. So what, what might this system look like if, um, you know, if we're looking at it from a sustainable, resilient uh, way to do it, how can we break this cycle? Well, the first thing to do is start with local bees. And, um, you know, these are bees that have, have adapted to our area. Uh, I should say that European honeybees, our honeybees, are not native to North America. They are... Um, they were introduced uh, probably in the 1500s by Spanish uh, settlers. Uh, the Spanish priests would often bring them along because they needed the beeswax for the uh, Catholic mass, uh, the candles for the Catholic mass. Um, so uh, when I say local, I'm, um, I'm talking about bees that have been adapted to our local environment and, um, and, and pressures. Um, the easiest way to, to use local bees is to make splits from your own hives. You know, if you've been beekeeping for a little while and you've got some survivor stock, um, you know, make splits off your own hives. And we'll talk about some of the ways to do that in a minute. But, um, you know, as beekeepers, this is our primary tool for increasing the number of bees we have. Another way is to uh, catch swarms. And um, we'll talk about trap hives. You know, swarms are really fun to catch. I love, um, I love getting swarm calls and going out to, you know, catch swarms, but it, you gotta be there, right? You gotta be willing to drop everything and go catch that swarm uh, because they're not sticking around for a while. So trap hives are a way that we can uh, set out boxes. And when there's a swarm, hopefully the bees will move into that box. And so we get to catch them, but we don't have to be there all the time or on call to go catch bees. And again, we'll talk about all of this stuff a little bit more in detail. Um, and the third way is really to raise local queens. So taking those genetics that have survived and, um, and propagating that. The second key that I really want to uh, focus on is to, to make more bees than you need, to, to keep more bees than you need. Um, and when we have these tools uh, in our tool you know, our toolbox here, we know how to make bees, we know how to catch swarms, we know how to raise our own queens, this becomes a lot easier. And um, uh, yeah, so that, you know, when we have say, okay, I've got five hives on the screen here. So as a new beekeeper, um, I recommend people keep three, four or five hives, even if they only feel like they, you know, need the honey from one or two, and the reason is when these environmental pressures come um, as they will, you know, everywhere, when you lose some and you will, uh, you have some left, right? You have some of this survivor stock that, um, that shows this resistance or some adaptation. 
So instead of making, you know, super mites, now we're making super bees, right? They're, they're adapted, they're strong. We know they can handle um, some of the things that, that our environment can throw at them. Well, then we use the stock when we're making our bees. And instead of this, um, so, you know, when this pressure, the environmental pressures or varroa mites or high beetles or whatever kind of disease you're talking about happens, it's less of a problem, right? They faced it before, they've survived. They maybe have been around for a season or two, cause less trouble. And so when you, you know, you've built your hives back up, of course, because you always make more hives than you need. Maybe you lose fewer hives this time. And again, you know, now we're in this feedback cycle that we're building the resilience of our hives. Every time we overwinter hives, um, we lose those that aren't suited and we keep those that are adapted. And just every year, we lose fewer and fewer hives, the pests and diseases and environmental problems are, are less and less of a, a problem. Um, here's another quote from that, um, from that same paper, just talking about um, Perot. It says, in addition to selective breeding, natural selection has yielded honeybee populations in Europe, North America, South America, and Africa that survive Varroa without parasite management. So, um, you know, there is evidence to suggest that honeybees have the genetic capability to overcome the problems in our environment right now, specifically Varroa, which is, you know, like I mentioned, our biggest problem. Um, the bees have the solution if we let them, uh, if we let them do it. Uh, this was made pretty clear, um, I guess, the, the power of, of local genetics. And, you know, I, <laughs> when I first started beekeeping, and even now I hear beekeepers say, well, bees are bees, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, there was actually a, a pretty large beekeeper here in Kentucky that moves hives around and um, is one of the, the largest beekeepers um, in this part of our, uh, in, in this part of the country, actually, just tell me, well, it doesn't matter. Bee genetics don't matter. They're all the same. Well, um, I don't agree with that. And, and this, um, I got to see Aaron McGregor Forbes here um, at, the, at the Eastern Apiculture Society meeting in, when they had it in Richmond, I believe that was 2014, um, give a talk on this study that they did. And what they did here was they, this was in Maine, okay? So pretty cold area. They bought in packaged bees. And um, what they wanted to do for the study was um, have, you know, control where they just bought packaged bees and, and figured out what the winter loss was. And then with the same packaged bees, um, same source, they requeened half of those with local queens in June. So they managed these two groups of, of colonies exactly the same management, brand new equipment, same sources of bees, everything was the same, except they requeened with the local queen. And um, here are the results. It says of the 20 standard packages that were not disqualified due to swarming, 65% had died by spring. As for the requeen packages of the 23 that were not disqualified, only 13% had died by spring. So package bees, 65% died. And that was that these are expert beekeepers, you know, that was no fault of the beekeeper. The only change they made was change the genetics and then their loss went down to 13%. Um, I found that a pretty convincing argument that the genetics of our bees make a difference. And uh, so that kind of made me a believer, um, you know, and this is, is kind of hopeful for folks that if you're just starting out in beekeeping and packages are, you know, available, that's what you can get. If you can't find somebody that has local stock or you don't want to fool with catching swarms, you can just buy packaged bees and then find somebody local that can um, raise a queen or that you can, you know, get a frame of, of brood off of and raise your own queen. Okay, I think that is a good place for questions. Um, I am going to stop sharing my screen for a minute and um, it looks like I can access, uh, access questions. We got quite a few here. Um, 
All right, Matt, I'm going to start back here uh, with Susie's question. Uh, can I have a queen Russian after I get a basic colony with the next generations being all Russian? I hear that they are stronger to weather and food supply. That's a good question about um, uh, Russians. Um, I like Russian bees a lot. Uh, they have shown uh, a bit more resistance to varroa mites. They are cold hardier, as you might expect for, for stocks that are um, coming from a cold place. What, um, after you get a basic colony. So I guess it, the way I read this question is, you know, if you buy in a queen that's a Russian queen, the next generation, will they be all Russian? Um, the way that um, honeybees uh, mate, and um, without going into too much detail, um, basically the queen's gonna take her mating flight and mate with maybe 15 different drones from the local area. And then when she comes back into the hive, when she lays eggs, it could be from any one of those 15 different drones. So unless you're talking about artificial insemination, which, you know, when you buy a queen, she's going to be open mated, um, most likely. They may have some drone saturation going on where they can control those genetics a little bit. But um, for, for the most part, and certainly for any bees that we raise locally, um, half of those genetics are going to be local drones. And so, um, you know, they'll, they'll display different characteristics based on both the mother's genetics, which would be that Russian side and whatever drone she mated with. And this is beneficial in the hive, right? Because it's like built-in diversity. There might be some drone she mated with that has really great mite biting capabilities. And maybe some of those are really super foragers and things like that. So um, yeah, it's never just, unless you're talking about artificial insemination and that's a whole other ball game where they're, they're doing uh, specifically for, for queen rearing, but yeah, great question. All right, Matt, uh, will you uh, just briefly address the difference between Eastern bees and European bees? Sure, um, uh, I, I'm assuming you're talking about Asian honeybees? Yeah, so earlier you were talking about, um, you know, the, the mites and how they jumped hosts. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So. Sure, sure. So they're actually different species. Um, our European honeybee is Apis mellifera. Its native range is Europe, Africa, and the near uh, Middle East. And um, the Asian honeybee is Apis serrana. It's actually different species. They're a little bit smaller bee. Um, and uh, they, they are used for, for honey production, but not, um, not to the same extent. They, they um, aren't managed quite the same way. So yeah, different species, but same genus. Great. And uh, Susie here has another one. Um, she's having issues with hornets in late summer. Um, she's tried screen barriers, but they still come in to the hive. Um, she wants to know if she can hang traps for the hornets near the hive. Uh, what are some good options? Yeah, um, that's a good question, Susie. I've never had trouble with hornets in my hive, so I, I, um, I don't have specific uh, answers for you there. Maybe some of our folks can, if they've had those issues, can chime in here with the chat. Um, I do know that um, restrict restricting the hive entrance often helps with any kind of, you know, with robbing and with hornets and things because, um, you know, they have to fi find their way through a smaller hole and that hole is more easily guarded by, by the guard bees there at the entrance. Um, I imagine you probably could put out some, um, you know, hornet hives that are meat based because hornets are attracted to, to, to meat and honeybees are not. Um, but I don't know the specific answer to that. That's a good question. I hope we can find, a, find that out. All right, Matt, uh, do you want to take a few more questions or, or do you want to plug away with the presentation for a little bit? Yeah, let's keep going for a bit and we'll come back okay. to, the, um, to the questions here. Great. Give me a minute. Okay, so we're gonna talk a little bit more in depth about um, 
making splits here. And we're not going into real detail um, on anything tonight. If you want more information, I love talking bees, so um, we can stay after and chat, or um, you know, I'll give you my contact info and, and happy to talk about uh, any of this in detail. But like I said, making splits is really the simplest way for us, if we already have bees, to get more bees. <clears throat> um, there are lots of ways to do it. And you know, this can be kind of confusing for new beekeepers is they find all these, oh, there's like this method and that method and everybody's kind of got their own way to do it. And what, <laughs> what that tells me is that it doesn't really matter. You know, one thing I learned um, a while back is that if there are a bunch of different ways of doing something, it's probably okay to use any of them. If there's one way that people do stuff, that's probably the way you should do it. But um, there's lots of ways to make splits and they all work pretty well. Um, one thing that's going on here that also can be beneficial, and this doesn't really have anything to do with the genetics of bees um, in overcoming Varroa, but it causes a brood break. So when you split a hive up, usually what you're doing is raising your own queen at the same time. And that causes a, a period of time in the hive where there aren't any um, brood, aren't, there, there are no larvae and specifically pupae. Um, the Varroa mite actually completes its life cycle inside of a closed pupal cell. And so when we don't have that, they're forced out of uh, those cells onto the bees where they're more easily picked off and it interrupts their cycle um, as well. So it can create um, some kind of tangential, you know, benefit to the, um, to the Varroa control that doesn't have anything to do with the genetics, but it just can kind of help. And one thing that they found is that when we raise young queens, so say you make a split in the summer and um, you let the bees raise their own queen, those young queens actually tend to lay a little bit longer into the winter. And so those bees are gonna be uh, younger. You know, the bees that overwinter are actually um, the bees that are born late in the season. You know, in the summer, honeybees only live about six weeks. Those field bees in spring and summer, they're out flying, they're, you know, getting rained on and, and you'll see it, you know, the, the old veteran bees coming in, their wings will be all tattered and they'll be, they'll be losing fuzz and everything. It's those young bees that are born at the end of the summer and in the early fall that actually are the ones that live over the winter. And so this can give some benefit to winter survival, to requeen. And that can happen when you're making splits. Um, you know, the easiest way to make a split is just to do a, what they call a blind split. You open the hive, you make sure that when, you know, you split up some of the frames and make sure there's some honey and some brood in both sides. You make sure there are eggs or very young larvae in both sides. You don't even have to find the queen with this method, <coughs> which can be, you know, hard. I mean, there's usually only one. Sometimes there's two, but um, we usually stop at one, right? Um, this is a skill that a lot of uh, new beekeepers have trouble with. And, and I struggled with it for a while to actually see eggs. Um, so this one on the left here is, is the egg down in the cell. And this is actually a larvae that is um, probably less than two days old at that size. Um, you can see it's kind of um, floating in a pool of, um, that's gonna be you know royal jelly type solution um, goop. And um, one trick that I've found uh, to find, to see the eggs, and this is a, a skill that you'll need to develop is, um, you put the sun at your back and like kind of let it shine in over your shoulder. And that way, you, you know, it's shining down into the comb as you, as you look in there. Um, but it can be tricky, but uh, basically, yeah, you just make sure you've got eggs on both sides. Uh, you're gonna be splitting them into two pieces. So the, um, you'll leave one where it is and you'll take, you know, the other split off somewhere else. Shake a few extra bees into the one you move and um, that's because some of those bees will fly back, right? They're a field force and they've already honed in on their home hive. So if you move them in the same yard, at least the same bee yard, they'll just go right back to the old hive. So shake some extras on there and that's it. That's the, you know, the basic split. Um, it works. Um, there are different ways to do it to, um, you know, for different purposes. You can make splits that will help you produce more honey. You can make splits where you're really trying to produce lots of bees. But in general, for most hives, uh, you should be able to make two or three splits per season off of off of an overwintered hive. Sometimes more, um, you know, and, and this may cut into your honey production a bit, but um, but this is a, a good general general rule. 
Um, if you want to learn more, there's a great uh, YouTube channel from the University of Guelph, which, you know, Ontario is not exactly our, uh, uh, it's not the same as Kentucky, right? It's some, some contextual differences here, but the general purposes are great and they really do a good job. So if you're, you know, if reading isn't your thing, um, if you learn better by watching, I really recommend checking out um, this YouTube channel. And like I said, I'll send links to all of this stuff after, um, after the session here. Um, so we're going to go on to uh, swarms now, catching swarms. This is uh, one of the swarms I caught uh, here in Berea, and I think it was probably the easiest swarm I ever caught. Uh, it was, this was in a hazelnut bush, and I just set my box under there and bent the branch down and shook the bees in there. This is a top bar hive, um, and uh, I'm not going to get into uh, hive styles tonight, but if you're thinking that's not a bee hive, um, it actually is. <clears throat> they don't often present themselves this way, right? Um, sometimes they're up 30 feet up in a pine tree or, you know, in a, a chain link fence or something. And so um, this is where having bait hives can really be uh, kind of a fun way and, and easier way to, uh, to get into catching swarms. So what a bait hive is, um, it's basically a box that uh, we make. Um, some, you can use bee equipment and um, you set it out and um, what you're trying to do is make this hive the most inviting place for swarms to move into. So they, you know, honeybees have this really awesome democratic kind of decision-making process when they're swarming. And if you're interested in this, there's a fascinating book called Honeybee Democracy by Thomas Seeley, who's a bee research, a uh, very well-known bee researcher, where he just figured this stuff out. You know, he would, um, um, make artificial swarms and then figure out how they kind of made decisions. And, um, and so uh, we have a lot of this good info. We know what bees like. And so that's the idea with these trap hives. You make a, a, a hive that's just gonna be perfect for them and they're gonna wanna move in and they'll send out scout bees and they'll check it out and they'll all vote on it. And they'll all decide eventually, yes, this is the place we wanna go and they'll move in. So these parameters are, they're the right size and for for us, that's uh, for honeybees, that's about 40 to 60 liters. Um, and I'll talk about what that means as far as hive equipment in a minute. But uh, you want to put it in the right place, too. Bees do like to be up off the ground uh, with, with, you know, bears and skunks and, and folks like that trying to um, eat the honey and eat the baby bees and stuff. They do like to be out of the danger zone there. So if you can get it up off the ground a bit, that's great. Uh, they do like to have the entrance facing east or south. They like to have sun in the morning. It helps them dry out. And then up in a tree is the native uh, habitat for honeybees is inside hollow trees. So if you can stack it in a tree like this or, um, um, you know, I, I would say get it up if you can. But if not, don't worry about it. I mean, plenty of people have, you know, put a hive on their back porch, you know, over the a week just to think, I, oh, I'm just I don't have anywhere to put them get on the back porch and bees move in, you know, on their porch. So. Um, don't endanger your life, right? <laughs> Getting up on a ladder or something. If you, it's not critical, but it just helps. Um, you want to do this at the right time. So this, this is swarm season, right? March through June, typically in our area. Um, anything later than that, and you may catch some swarms, but they might not have time to build up enough to overwinter successfully. And then the right smell. You want it to, to smell homey like bees. So if you can put an old comb in there, that's, you know, get your old black comb or uh, whatever. Um, you can rub propolis on the inside, um, on the wood. And then uh, most of the time people are using lemon, either lemongrass oil or um, a swarm lure. They make um, artificial swarm lures. And this is essentially mimicking the Nazanoff pheromone, which is, you know, bees communicate a lot about a lot of different things through smell. And this is their, um, their homing pheromone. It's the one that they fan when they're swarming and it says, hey, this is, this is home, this is the place to be. And so that's just kind of an added um, lure, you know, uh, that can bring them in. So a lot of times these swarm traps are just uh, boxes that people build. Um, I do recommend, um, yeah, thanks Shane, that's a great, uh, the old um, um, adage, a swarm in May is worth a load of hay, a swarm in June is worth a silver spoon, and a swarm in July isn't worth a fly, right? That's kind of given that idea of the later they go, um, 
the less value they are. But uh, if you're interested in building your own uh, swarm traps, there's a, a this website, horizontalhive.com, I recommend Dr. Leo Sharashkin. He's a really interesting character and has a lot of great information about um, different kinds of hives, but he's got a whole page on how to set out the um, swarm traps and stuff is great. So I'll recommend checking it out. Um, and uh, so again, the size, we're looking for about 40 to 60 liters. That's so a 10 frame deep, the normal Langstroth deeps is about 43 liters. So that that right in there in that um, nice size. It's a little awkward to put them up in a tree because they're kind of wide, but um, right size. You can use two, two nuke boxes, uh, five frame nuke boxes stacked on top of each other. So that's 46 liters. That's about the right volume. A single nuke is too small. Um, you might get a couple of swarms, but they'll be small swarms, you know, big swarms then not to move into small boxes. So um, and if you're using eight frame equipment, uh, right now I'm using all eight frame mediums because I like one size of equipment and I don't like lifting 10 frame deeps. Um, I've got a kind of a bad back and, and those things can weigh a lot uh, when they're full of bees and honey. So um, two eight frame mediums is about 48 liters. And um, so that's, that's about the right size for that too. Um, again, if you, if you want to make your own swarm traps, um, they, they can be really cheap to make. You usually use, you know, plywood or something, put a few frames in there. Um, again, I recommend this Horizontal Hive um, website. He's got some great free plans and stuff. Um, the thing is, if you build your hives uh, or just swarm traps, that's all you can do with them, really, right? Um, you might be able to use them for nukes or, or something like that. But um, one of the benefits, if, if you use equipment that's already part of your apiary, um, then when you move those bees out of the tree or whatever, you can just rotate them into your normal equipment um, rotation. Whereas if you've got dedicated swarm traps and you know, when you're done with them in June, they go into the shed and that's all you can do with them until March. But you know, they all work, use what works. Um, so again, just a couple of points. You wanna set them out before swarm season. You wanna check on them about every week. And um, you know, if you leave them too long, they'll start to build up comb in there. Typically you've only got enough frames in there um, to fill the top of the box. Sometimes the boxes are deeper. And so they'll continue to build comb down and get it crossed up and things. So you want to check on them. And uh, when they're flying, you know, you may see bees flying in and out, but um, a lot of times that can be scout bees. So the definitive way to tell, I mean, obviously, other than opening it up, which you'll have to get up there and, and take it down, of course. Um, but if they're, if you see them bringing pollen, then that means they've moved in. Um, scout bees don't carry pollen. So um, that's kind of, you see pollen, it's, it's time to move it. And of course we move them at night, just like any bees, right? If you try to move them in the middle of the day, half the bees will be out foraging and, and you'll miss them. Um, so that's a good point. You know, don't put them <laughs> too far out of the way or, you know, you gotta navigate the maze of poison ivy to get there in the dark, right? Uh, be safe, um, have fun. And um, it's, a, it's a really fun way to, to, catch tree, uh, to catch bees up in the tree. You know, the big, the big elephant in the room here, right, is <laughs> who knows if they're gonna move in or not, right? We can take these, these actions, um, we can put them in the nice place, but it's just still kind of a, a random um, whether you're gonna get bees to move in or not. Um, but, you know, it's low risk and spend some time building boxes and, um, and um, high reward potentially, right? For every swarm you catch, that's, that's a package of bees you don't have to buy at a hundred plus bucks a pot, right? So. Um, I, you know, I've had, well, I'm, I've uh, got a beekeeping friend here in Kentucky that in their second year, and they, I think he built five uh, swarm traps and caught seven swarms this year and multiple hits on the same traps. So like better than a hundred percent is pretty good return on your investment for building a few boxes and sticking them out, right? Okay, I'm gonna take another quick break here. and see about questions. All right, Matt. So I've got a question here from Shane about DNA. Is there, a, any, is there any correlation with restricting new DNA to local bee colonies uh, to weak hives? Is there a connection to stronger hives by spreading your hives out more than keeping them closer together in the apiary? 
Um, I'm not sure I quite understand that question, Shane, but I'll try to um, restrict in new DNA. I don't, I don't quite, I don't quite understand the first part. Um, the spreading out the hives um, is actually beneficial. Um, you know, if we, if we pack too many bees in the same bee yard, they definitely can spread, um, you know, spread disease. They take up the same, you know, there's drift that happens, right? So bees get confused and they go into the hive next to them. Um, this is especially true if you line your bees up and then, or your hives up in a nice pretty line and they're all painted white. Um, bees get confused. And so spreading them out is great. Um, there has been some, some work um, by, again, by Tom Seeley, actually, where looking at feral hives, you know, part of the reason why they're able to survive better than our managed colonies is the fact that they're, they're spread out. They're not right next to each other, and they're able to handle um, those environmental pressures a little bit um, better. <coughs> um, I can actually see the questions here, Chris. Okay. Um, so let's see, there's the cricket again. I always forget to turn off my kid's bedtime alarm during these, uh, <laughs> these sessions. Okay. So there's a question here about beekeepers in Louisiana. Um, they were beekeepers in Louisiana and now moved to Tennessee. Locals on our road tell us they can't keep bees here because of a native mountain black bee that kills their bees. Um, there are native black bees. Um, I've never heard of them killing other bees other than perhaps robbing out hives. Um, sorry, I shouldn't say native black bees. There was a, the, the, there was a German black bee that was um, one of the earlier strains of, of European black bee that we have here in the United States. Um, they tended to be a little bit um, more aggressive and um, you know, at this point, it, there's probably a lot, they're all mixed genetics, right? Bees move around, they, they mate um, with everybody in the neighborhood, all the, the bees in the neighborhood. So, um, you know, I'd be interested to hear more about that. Uh, there can certainly be robbing that takes place. So if you, you know, if you have a wheat colony and there are strong colonies in the area and there's a dearth, um, a period where there isn't enough nectar or honey, strong colonies will come in and rob weaker colonies and they can certainly kill a colony that way. So that may be what they're talking about. But um, yeah, I don't, I haven't specifically heard about that as a problem uh, with, with black bees. Uh, swarm Commander, yep. It's one of the commercial um, lure products uh, for bait swarms. And um, moving bees in the winter. Yeah, um, you can move bees in the winter, you, but you hit the nail on the head. You want to be careful about clustering, right? If they're, so bees form this ball in the winter that keeps them warm. And if you, you know, if you're moving that cluster or that colony and say they're in a truck, you know, and you hit a ditch and they break cluster and it's too cold outside, they actually physically can't move enough to get back into that cluster. So um, you can move them in the winter. You might want to wait until some warmer days, you know, it's up in the fifties or something. Um, you can, you know, if you're just going to move them a little bit and you can be really gentle with them, then it should be fine. But, um, yeah. Yeah. So flying bee ranch depends on how you're transporting them. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, 35 miles. Okay. Well, I'd say pick a warm day. Um, and that way, you know, they're at least, they at least should be able to, um, to move around a little bit and get back into that cluster if they get, if they get broken up. Uh, Tricks to love from, uh, let's see. Uh, are there any tricks to move bees from inside a building? Yeah. Um, so what you're talking about is usually called a cutout and uh, it's messy. <laughs> there's, no, there's no tricks. It's just messy. Um, you, the definitive way to get bees out of, of some kind of enclosed space like that is to open the wall and um, take out all the combs and you, you will get stung and you will kill bees and you'll get honey everywhere. And you may or may not catch the queen, right? She tends to hide. Um, it's not something that, um, you know, beginning beekeepers tend to <laughs> dive right into because you want to be suited up. Um, if you have a bee back, it helps. Uh, you can get a lot of honey out of it, right? Sometimes those colonies have been in, in the walls for years and um, you can actually take those combs and rubber band them into empty 
frames and put them in a you know start uh, put them in a colony and then either bring in a queen or if you're lucky enough to catch the queen you can start a colony from that but then you know you've got this big mess so it is possible um, there's another way called the trap out that you essentially put a cone of uh, screen on the front of the hive and put a box next to it that has some comb in it and as the bees it's a one-way bee valve, essentially. They, they come out, but they can't get back in the cone. And the next best thing is to go in this box that you have prepared for them. It takes weeks. It often doesn't work. And you leave all the bees in, uh, or all the comb inside the wall and you won't get the queen. So the colony will certainly die. You might get some bees, but um, really the definitive ways to do a cutout. Um, yeah, okay. I am going to uh, leave that there. We've got just a little bit left on the presentation and then people can stick around if they want to, uh, to keep chatting. Let's keep moving. Okay. All right, so this kind of third leg of our stool for local bees is raising our own queens and it, you know, this can be as, as complicated or as simple as you make it, um, like a lot of things in beekeeping. The easiest way is you just use queen cells that are um, already being developed from your strong hives um, in the spring. Now, I, you know, your bees probably have never swarmed, um, <clears throat> but mine have. And, um, you know, the bees, your strong colonies in the spring, if you don't catch, uh, catch them and manage their swarming, which we're not going to go into, but um, yeah, this is a natural reproductive process. They're going to make queen cells. And um, when those queen cells are about to hatch, the old queen takes, you know, maybe half the bees with her and goes and swarms. And that's kind of what happens. So if you can catch uh, that colony while they're making these queen cells, and these are, this is an upside down comb, if you haven't seen it, these are queen cells they are kind of peanut shaped. These are open and you can see the um, larvae or pu uh, larvae, yeah, right in this one. So the easiest way is, you, you know, you see some of this, you think, hey, yeah, this is a good, like strong colony. I wouldn't mind having these genetics. And you split this hive up and make sure there are queen cells in the splits you make and that's queen rearing. You know, make sure there's at least one, maybe two in each one. You can do more than that. Uh, the first one to hatch will uh, go around and kill her sisters and, you know, um, duke it out. Uh, gladiator style, but, um, or you can actually even take these and gently cut them out and put them into to splits that you make. So it's as simple as letting your bees raise their own queens. Um, here's another picture of, of uh, a queen cell here, this kind of peanut shape, um, and actually a virgin queen. We cut this hive um, right as one of the queens had hatched, but the others hadn't, so interesting. Um, one caution on this, you, if you see a queen cell coming out of the side of a comb like this, it may be a supersedure, which is where, uh, for, for a number of reasons, the, the bees decided they needed to make a new queen, either because the old queen was failing or because the beekeeper <laughs> squished her on accident or something. They've actually used uh, worker eggs to make a queen in this case. So um, maybe don't pick this one when you're making um, new splits, you know, pick the ones that are on the sides and the bottom like this. Um, now the, the caveat or the, um, the way that we can actually manage this behavior. And if you're interested in raising Queens, um, a great beginner kind of technique is called this on the spot, um, queen rearing by, uh, Mel Disselkull in here. And this link here, um, is to a really great, um, PDF of his method. But basically what you do is you take this, this behavior where, um, if you take a queen out of a colony, the bees will try to raise an emergency queen and they use the worker eggs for that and the worker larvae, as long as they're young enough. So, you know, you get your hide tool or something else and you just break, you know, you find some larvae that are less than two days old or eggs and you break the um, comb underneath, directly underneath those cells without damaging them. And then the bees take that as a cue along with the absence of the queen to raise new queens and they'll make them in the proper orientation and facing down. And uh, you can use those queens to make to make splits. You let them do the open mating, 
um, you know, get those local genetics in. And uh, with this system, you know, you don't have to fool. From here, it can get more complex, right? Uh, you know, when you, you hear queen rearing, a lot of times people are thinking about grafting larvae with little tools and you've got, you know, these like lights and binocular things and you're, um, you've got all these tiny little hives out and you're mating yard and stuff. And if you want to go that direction, that's great. Um, it, it can be really fascinating and um, potentially profitable. You know, you can raise local queens and sell them for 25, 30 bucks a pop. And, um, you know, for half a dozen strong hives, you, you, you could crank out quite a lot of queens. Um, so, but I just wanted to, to talk about some of the possibilities. You know, it doesn't have to be a complex thing. We do have a Kentucky Queen Breeders Association. So if you uh, want to learn more, they are, you know, they're putting on workshops and things, or you can contact them. If you want to find locally adapted queens, this would be a great place to start. And then I hope that we're thinking now, well, let's become sources of local bees, right? Um, you can sell nukes. And this is, this is, is you know, these splits. It's the usually five frames in a, in a box. It's got, you know, two, three frames of brood a frame of honey and an empty comb or partially made comb in there. And um, you make them up and typically, uh, and what I would recommend is making summer um, nukes and overwintering them and then selling them the next spring. And, you know, this is perfect if you don't really like, like people, but you like bees. Um, you know, you can have one or two customer days where they come pick up their nukes every day or every year. And then you don't have to sit at a farmer's market or try to sell online or any of that stuff. Um, and you know, you'd be helping new beekeepers, right? If you're using these locally adapted bees and as you continue to raise them, they're gonna be casting swarms and the drones are gonna be flying out and mating with other local queens and you're contributing then to the solution, right? To bringing up all of the bees in your area to this level of um, competence with the Varroa and with uh, our local, local um, conditions here. Um, one final thing I just wanna mention as, as beekeepers, is uh, habitat. You know, we can do a lot for um, for our bees, but also be thinking about the native pollinators. You know, as I mentioned, European honeybees are not native. Um, they can actually occupy some of the same niches and use some of the same resources as our native pollinators. So one of the very best things we can do both for our honeybees and for all of the native pollinators is to plant native poll uh, pollinator habitat. Um, so I encourage everybody to do that. So the take home. Use local bees, uh, however you can. Splits, catch swarms, raise them uh, out of your own bees, uh, raise, raise queens, find local bees. Uh, number two, make more bees than you need. Uh, twice as much, I'd say. And that way, you know, it's way easier to build back up from survivor stock than it is to lose everything and have to start from scratch. It means you're gonna need a little bit more equipment, right? But the um, the benefit is once you learn how to make bees, you don't have to pay for bees anymore. So it more than offsets the cost of the equipment. And then let the genetics overcome the challenges. You know, the only long-term solution to this without staying on that treadmill is to let the bees adapt. And we can help them with that or we can hinder them in that. Um, like I mentioned at the beginning, we have some small farm support at Grow Appalachia. So um, there are two of us on staff that actually do on-farm production planning. We can come out and work with you um, if you're a beekeeper or if you're doing any kind of agriculture, really. And we do have a, an, uh, an, an area in eastern and central Kentucky that we're um, able to work in, so get in touch. Um, we also have um, gardening supplies. We do organic fertilizer and irrigation systems, and then we build high tunnels, do high tunnel installation and support. So. Um, we're available for broader uh, small farm support as well, Grow Appalachia. Please contact us if you're interested in some of that. Um, I should note that um, it's, uh, our on-farm production planning is, is completely free to farmers. So um, this is made possible through the Kentucky Agricultural Development Fund, um, generous grant that supports our work. And if you wanna learn more, here are some resources. Um, specifically about this kind of uh, ethos of, you know, letting the bees do some of the work and, and being treatment free and, and that, um, that kind of information. I'll leave it there. And we are three minutes over. I appreciate you uh, sticking around here. Um, 
I am happy to stay and answer questions. And, um, but I do want to be cognizant of, of everybody's time. So if you, if you decide to peace out now, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming tonight. And um, please get in touch if you want to chat B some more. And um, appreciate y'all.